welcome to The Art of Taking Care, an evening with writers and caregivers. I'm Danielle Ofri, Editor-in-Chief of Bellevue Literary Review, and today we're celebrating the 45th issue of BLR, which has the theme of taking care, and we're so glad you can join us. A very special thanks to AARP, who helped support this issue of BLR, as well as tonight's event. And for those of you who've been to BLR online readings before, you know that we typically feature one poet, one fiction writer, and one nonfiction writer in conversation with a BLR editor, which we will do. But we'll also be joined tonight by three incredible caregivers who will share their insights about the caregiving process, as well as their thoughts about the role of art and creativity. But first, we want to give you a peek into the background of the gorgeous cover of the current issue, painted by the artist Tatana Kellner. Kellner is a wide-ranging artist whose practice encompasses printmaking, papermaking, drawing, painting, photography, installation, everything, you name it. And I first stumbled across these paintings on her website, and I was immediately smitten. And I thought, wow, these you know five by seven images would fit perfectly on our cover, front and back. Well. I had no idea what five by seven meant till I paid a visit to her studio, a stunning reconstructed barn in upstate New York. First, we had to unload the paintings from their storage site. And as you can see, Tatana Kellner is as nimble a ladder climber as she is an artist. The paintings were huge and heavy. We lugged them over to her official art display table, which sometimes also serves as a ping pong table. And you can see her beautiful studio here. Here we are unrolling the painting that became the back cover of BLR. And you can see how enormous it is. It nearly covers the entire ping pong table. This painting is titled Together and it's just stunning. And here we are unwrapping the gorgeous painting that became the front cover of this issue of BLR. It's titled Solace. And the minute I'd spotted on her website, I knew this was the perfect front cover for BLR's special issue on taking care. But I couldn't even have imagined the richness of color till I saw it in person. Again, mm. thinking about our theme of taking care, there's something so gentle in the offering. Either there holding the head, cleaning. Yeah, it's almost like, it's, it's caressing, like holding and then caressing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the head looks unwell, you know, somebody right. who is unwell. So this is somebody taking care of that person. I'm okay. curious if the theme of caregiving in the art world, like how artists take care of each other or mentor other ones, do you have any, does that resonate for you at all? Well, I think because the work I have done at the workshop, Mm -hmm. for over four decades. Yes, I mean, it's about bringing up the next generation and also teaching people or giving them vocabulary so they can practice what they're passionate about. Right. You know? And what about taking care, like you're here alone in the studio, all this art, all of this emotion. How do you take care of yourself in there? I think by making more work. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think by the, I'm the happiest when I'm sort of in the middle of trying to solve a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Artist Tatana Kellner is also clearly happiest when playing ping pong. As I mentioned earlier, our readings feature a poet, a fiction writer, and a nonfiction writer in conversation with a BLR editor, usually the editor who edited that piece. But today, our nonfiction writer, Eric Raymond, will be interviewed by a fiction editor, Rana Weinberg, because of an unexpected and incredibly poignant coincidence. When the nonfiction team picked Eric's essay out from the slush pile, it was because we were so moved by his recollections of caring for his wife, Kim, in the terminal stages of a progressive neurological illness. It was only after the essay was accepted that Eric mentioned that his wife, Kim, had a story published in BLR many years ago, and how she treasured that acceptance, keeping it pinned over her desk for years. And so we've invited fiction editor Ronald Weinberg, who'd edited Kim Puckett's story, Where Our Paths Run, from BLR issue 11. 
and she'll interview Eric. Eric Raymond will start us off reading an excerpt from his essay, Revisions. We were both aspiring fiction writers when we first met back in graduate school, but now our story had reduced to nonfiction only. Kim and I were two characters flattened by the whims of the remote white islands aglow on her brain scans. Together we adapted, reducing the scope of our freedoms and our marriage until we were forced to the narrowest margins of our lives. The gradual calcification of Kim's brain had stolen her balance, her mobility, and her fine motor control, tilting her world with vertigo and subjecting her to gravity's punishing concussions and broken teeth. It had doubled her vision and slurred her voice, forced her to writhe and choke. After eight years of neurological deterioration from Farr's syndrome, Kim decided she would no longer wait for the disease to finish its work. She had seeded too much of her life and would not allow for the possibility of dementia or psychosis. Her only remaining agency in our story was to deny the disease the final word and revise the ending on her own terms. That became our plan with my promise to help her realize it. In California, the process is this. A patient indicates they want to stop treatment and end their life. The patient's doctor and a second doctor must agree that the patient's life expectancy is less than six months and that aid in dying medications will prevent undue suffering. A psychiatrist must then confirm the patient's decision is uncoerced and undistorted by mental illness. Only after a two week waiting period and a final confirmation alone with their doctor can the patient receive the final paperwork and a prescription from a compounding pharmacy. During each of these appointments, the patient must affirm that they can administer the drugs themselves as the law requires. The day we learned all of this happened to be one of our final in-person appointments with Kim's neurologist. We didn't yet know that the pandemic would empty the streets and distance us from our doctors, nurses, and physical therapists. A specialist in movement disorders with a focus in palliative care, Kim's neurologist was that rare doctor who didn't shy away from the difficult truths of dying or deploy vague platitudes to obscure the fact that she too was powerless. We loved her full presence with Kim's distress and how she made time for us despite the huge demands of her own schedule. Still, it could be hard at times to separate Kim's degradation from the doctor's assessments, and I often found myself resentful in our after-visit summaries. My anger was brittle from seeing the care while being forced to admit each change, standing by and absorbing the long narrative of Kim's suffering. The day we declared our intent to defy the disease was not a day of celebration, but we did feel fleetingly empowered. Through all that had been unpredictable and humiliating, we experienced a touch of relief, a flash of sun in the valley between decision and final action. Every subsequent appointment, however, forced us up against the truth of what we were pursuing. Kim's day-to-day suffering was intolerable, but it was incomparable to our decimation each time Kim was asked to reassert her wish to die. The final confirmation appointment with the neurologist took place over Zoom during the early months of the COVID pandemic. Because I wasn't allowed to be in the room for Kim's crucial decision, I needed to devise a method for her to clarify her choice since she was no longer able to speak clearly, especially in emotionally charged situations. I printed two full-size sheets of paper, one with the word yes, the other with no, and placed them face up on the dining table where the computer's camera could see them. When asked to choose, Kim could simply flop a hand on one of the two responses. After establishing the Zoom connection, I left the room and waited, reflecting on how many of her joys had vanished in the past year. Using her iPad was now impossible. No more texting friends or practicing Italian on Duolingo. If I left her on the couch in front of PBS so that I could steal time from my own work, I would return to find her sliding off the cushions, unable to hold herself upright. When I explained the pandemic world's eerie vacancy and everyone's isolation from friends and family, it took me a few attempts to understand her response. Welcome to my country. When you and I spoke a few days ago, you said that you mostly write 
fiction and screenplays. I wondered why you decided or how you decided to take this experience and write it in nonfiction rather than fictionalizing it. You know, it's funny. I, I have used aspects of the, the caregiving uh, in fiction. Um, I'm definitely trying to translate that emotional experience in fiction. But when it came to writing about Kim and I directly, um, I, it, it felt like I didn't need I didn't need the masked invention of fiction. And I also needed to be able to um, direct directly address Kim at times. Um, I think there's a point in the essay where it shifts to you. And that's that's a way for me to access that. That in fiction, I, I could have adopted a voice, but I, I decided not to. And that was very effective in the essay when you shifted and you spoke directly to Kim. You know, we, we, we got the two sides of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really, it's very beautifully written. And every time I, I read it, I'm very moved. Um, how long did you work on this piece? Um, I started it in 2021, I believe, um, just sort of sketching out ideas. Um, I didn't know what the, the central piece of the essay would be per se, other than the right to die medication and, and that process. Um, and it, it came in fits and starts and I didn't really finish it, uh, finish a version I felt I could submit until about a year later. Um, but it was sporadic work. And how long after Kim passed away did you begin the essay? Oh, that's interesting. Um, it was, she, she died in October of 2020. So it was, it was not, not a full year later, um, that I started to to poke around at the idea. Um, in revisions, in the essay, you mentioned that you and Kim were in graduate school together and that, um, I, I don't remember if maybe that's how you met, but you yeah. were in graduate yeah. creative yeah. writing school together. Yeah. Kim wrote a story that we published in the BLR 17 years ago. Yeah. And I was her editor. I edited the story, which is one of the reasons I'm interviewing yeah. you. So it's kind of amazing. So it's really a wonderful and very poignant coincidence that the Bellevue Literary Review will be publishing your piece. So getting back to revisions, um, I wondered how you decided on structuring the story. It has a very interesting and effective structure, I thought. I, you know, it's interesting because this piece was, I mean, I would say it's highly collaborative. <clears throat> Um, the editorial process at Bellevue was was very hands on and and very um, very intense in in a way because I turned in a draft of this essay which was much more experimental. Um, the pieces were in a different sort of order. Um, a lot that's in the essay now wasn't in the first uh, submission, um, and so I worked I worked with uh, Danielle and Scott um, on on the structuring of it, um, probably to move it make it a little more, more linear and also uh, also I think so that it, it fit with the uh, with the journal what what the the issue was gonna was trying to, to convey and and because the edit we always edit pieces very hands-on and how did you find that process um uh, it, that's interesting because um I had a uh, I had a, a grief counselor therapist in Kim the end of Kim's life and um, Paul, he was, a, he was just a great, great guy. And he had this phrase, he said, you know, allow. The thing about grief was you, you're you going to want to control this process. You're going to want to have, you know, I'm going to get back to my life. Everything's going to change. And and so he would say allow. And I would say in a hands-on editorial process, there's a little bit of grief. You, you know, you you see changes and, and you say, no, no, this can't be right. I, I, I don't, I don't do this at all. And, and if you, you know, there's a sense of submitting to it and to an understanding it is a collaborative process at that point um, that that I was very glad to have. Once you allowed the process to take shape. Yeah, once I, allowed, was, no, right. I was screaming privately. No, that was... <laughs> right, I know. No, it's always hard. You know, it's always nice when an editor pays attention to your work, but it's always hard when changes are asked of things that you like and that you labored over. Sure. Oh, it's, it's true. I mean, that, that is true. And I, and, you know, they, they were gentle about it. They were, you know, it was very much, you know, I, they, I had plenty of space to say, no, I can't deal with that change, or, you know, but they were great changes. So Good. it wasn't hard in the end. Good. I'm glad. Well, it worked out well. Um, another question is, 
I wondered how you balance your your writing. Your you're writing fiction, you're writing screenplays, and now nonfiction. You mentioned that you might even turn this into a memoir when we mm -hmm. spoke. And yeah. so I, I wonder how you balance all that in terms of structuring your time. Well, you know, the thing about working on a novel for me is that it's a daily process. It's a show up every day process for me. I'm, I'm sort of a ritualistic writer in that way. Um, what I found writing the nonfiction, especially on the topic of Kim and the caregiving, was that that writing did not feel like it could be forced into a workaday formula. Um, there is a lot of gathering that takes place. And so what I find is I'll make notes and I'll keep those notes aside. And I've collected islands for future essays. And there is another essay already. Um, and there are islands to be written, uh, you know, going forward, which, which may make a book. But to say it is a book or it will be a book, again, there's a little bit of that surrender that has to come into play. Yeah. 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 And I imagine that writing um, something that's so close to the bone and so close to your heart is very emotional. So as you were saying, it's hard to just do it day after day after day. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think with fiction, there tends to be a lot of problem solving on the page. You know, uh -huh. as you, I think you well know. Um, you know, in writing fiction that you, you come against problems and you puzzle them out. And, and, and then there is emotional weight there. But when you're doing this, this sort of reflecting on a, on a caregiving experience in particular, uh, yeah, it's, it's more difficult to it's yeah. heavier lifting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's really wonderful and in a sense, amazing that you were able to capture the experience in such a way that the reader could experience it I'm because glad. many many people go through a caregiving experience but aren't really able to communicate what it's like, but you were able to communicate it. I found when I came across a piece of writing which really saw inside the caregiving experience, it resonated with me so much. Mm -hmm. And I felt seen and I felt less alone. And that is ultimately what I would hope would come out of this essay uh, for a reader um, and for caregivers out there. That was my next question. Is what do you hope? <laughs> you, you, you knew what it was. What 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 you hope that the readers will take away from this essay? Well, I I hope on one point that they see the inside of of an end of life decision. Of course, um, that, you know I think we're going to see more end of life um, medical aid and dying um, issues come up in, in a lot of different states, and I would like them to feel less alone. You know to know that there is, and I think that's something future essays include, you know, what happens afterwards um, once the caregiving ends, um, which I was not expecting how that played out at all. Mm -hmm. so. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk with me. We appreciate your sharing your time and your essay with us. Well, I thanks, thanks to everybody at Bellevue who helped this find its final form. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rana. I now want to introduce a caregiver, we're not using her real name here, who is an example of how incredibly busy people also become caregivers. Uh, currently, I am working for a nonprofit. And what we do is we provide a support to parents who are looking for a subsidy to support them paying for childcare. And then I also help uh, clients who want to get licensed to provide childcare, or open up a child care center, and we also do training, uh, community events, lots of outreach. Oh, and tell me what sort of caregiving you're doing or have done. So right now, I'm a caregiver for my father. He's 90 years old, and he is a Korean War veteran. His name is Charles. And I'm curious, is there anything that's, that surprised you about caregiving or was unexpected compared to what you previously thought caregiving would be? I think the surprise is that I was a caregiver. I just, it never even crossed my mind that I would be his caregiver. Um, I think the other thing was how my father changed over time. Um, very, my dad's very proud, very intelligent. Um, he's a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. Um, but he became very um, tenderhearted, um, very thankful and grateful. Um, just very sweet. And I'm curious if you've ever turned to the arts or music or literature, something for, for comfort in, in any way during this caregiving process? So um, I like to do puzzles, um, Sudoku. Um, I have a coloring book 
And um, I never thought, you know, I would do coloring. I saw adult coloring books all the time. And I thought adult coloring books, but I didn't realize how soothing and calming it is just to take time and do some coloring. Um, and then I like to listen to worship music. I journal. Um, I read my Bible for comfort. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I've done to help me during this time. And when you're writing in your own journal, are you writing kind of what happened that day or are you writing beyond the events of the day? Um, I think in this caregiver experience, I've learned some things about myself. So I'm writing in those things, mm -hmm. learned things about my dad. Um, and just this whole, pur there's purpose in this. It's not just a duty. Like there's purpose in everything that we're doing to take care of him and just really seeing um, how he's being taken care of um, in a way that even surprised him. And if I might ask, does anyone in the medical profession ever talk to you about death or, or what it entails, what it might, mm -hmm. the experience might be like? Um, so we do have palliative care. <clears throat> and so we have been talking to um, someone just about preparing mm -hmm. um, because he's not, he's not sick. He's just an elderly person. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not talking about a diagnosis of what can happen, but um, just knowing that we do have to prepare. Um, and I guess that would be one fear, you know, for me, it's just knowing that now that dad is stable and he's in a good place and I have a relationship with him. Um, I have to think about the fact that he, you know, is going to die, you know. And what would you like others to know about the caregiving experience, particularly those who have never done it or might be doing it or starting the process? Mm -hmm. I would say um, give yourself lots of grace and compassion. Um, no one's ever prepared to be a caregiver no one's, we're not trained to do this. It kind of lands in your lap. Thank you for sharing those insights with us. We now turn to poetry. Lucia Owen was a high school English teacher who started writing poetry seriously in 2019 at about the same time she began taking care of her husband of almost 48 years. She'll read her poem, Emergency, and then be interviewed by assistant poetry editor, Omatara James. Emergency. My heart didn't ache exactly, though perhaps I had drunk something I didn't remember as I got out of bed. A drowsy numbness, then a speeding up, a surge, a tension flaring in my left breast, more than melancholy. Because our living here and his care depend completely on me, because this cannot happen, I will not let it happen, I will not. I decide I have to have it checked because he starts putting stuff in his man bag to go with me to the ER, where I know it will not be happening, but I want to be sure it isn't, because it still feels like caffeine rushing. I ask him how he will get home if I have to stay, because he depends on a walker and a wheelchair and drove the car last two years ago, because he shrugs and keeps getting ready, I have to help him down and out into the car because on the way I say, we really need a plan for when something happens to me. He nods. Because when we get there, there's no close parking. Because I can't leave him in the car, I go get a wheelchair, get him out of the car, into it, fumble for masks, push him from the parking lot into the ER. And at reception, I stop and say, I think I may be having a cardiac episode. Thank you. That reading was beautiful. Thank you, thank you. It's a poem that has a real sense of urgency. It's very persuasive. It begins with the speaker in a state of crisis. The aspect of the everyday caretaker who faces on a daily basis the mundane aspect of taking care that juxtaposed to the crisis of having to care for one's own body. So my first question is, how was the experience of writing this poem? Well, the first thing is that it's absolutely true. I almost literally came home from the episode when I'd been cleared and there was nothing wrong with me. 
and I wrote it as it happened. And the thing that caught me was the last line. Mm. I think I may be having a cardiac episode because it had, by the time I got to the end of the day and the poem, it had a double meaning or a triple meaning because I was having a cardiac episode cardiac arrest because it could have been me, but what about him? And then he was worried about me and the whole complication of what happens when the two of you are trying to take care of each other and both of you are sort of shorting out doing it. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those gift of a poems then that right. just kind of comes to you. Uh, right. as you're like going through right. the event. And right. it, and it, and in some ways it reads that way because the way that it begins in the middle of things where suddenly in the urgency of the poem, oftentimes when we're in crisis, we turn to poems, we turn to art. And so I wonder how and when you came to write poetry. The first, the first thing is that the opening lines of the poem, literally when I woke up, it's the opening lines of Keats's um, um, Ode to a Nightingale, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness, you know. And I was an English teacher and line, you know, you sort of staple pieces of poetry to you. And that was exactly how I felt. But my husband, go back a ways, my husband and I um, both taught at the same school. He was the art mm -hmm. guy and I taught English. And he would say to me over and over again, how can you how can you teach what you don't do he was a craftsman and he was after me and after me and after me and finally after we retired he said i'm not going to bother with you anymore until you straighten out and decide that you can do this so i started i started seriously writing poetry and here's the ironic part in the spring of 2019 he's 11 years older than i which uh, in and in 2019 uh, in the spring he fell broke his femur. Mm. Um, and that began the four and a half years that I took care of him at home and he died last February. Um, and in that time that he was in rehab, I had three poems accepted. The first three poems that I had ever submitted were accepted and they were going to be published. And here's he he's in rehab. So, mm. but bless him, he came to my to the book launch in his wheelchair. We Oh, wow. So friends brought us down and we did it. And then as, as we were together trying to unscramble this caregiving or caretaking thing, he was still my best critic. You know, he was a very, very avid reader and thinker. And I would read poems to him and you know, he, he wouldn't give me line by line things, but he certainly could tell me whether it worked or whether he did, it didn't. And I always listened. And this, this gave us a way of, of, of interacting and, and talking about things other than the horrible stuff that was going on. Uh, it was, it was terrific. And then for me, besides that, the poem became poetry writing became kind of this little alcove in a day, you know, where I could kind of tuck myself in and either write about something totally different or try to do something that was processing what I was going through a, a new territory for me. I didn't know, so what did it feel like? What 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 was going on? How could I express it? I tell you right now that a lot of the poems are about anger. Mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of really really good angry poems <laughs> because I discovered that what I was angry about was that I couldn't stop what was happening to him. They say that you know oftentimes the poet turns to the page for justice. Um, to write something or change something that cannot be changed because of time right. and other factors. Uh, I love what you said about the project of you know your poetry being something that could bring you and your husband together with you know without it being about illness, you know, it, it giving you a fresh way, to connect and as a source of connection, what is your hope for this poem as a caregiver? The reason that I submitted it and what I'd like people to take from it mm -hmm. is that I think it encapsulates all the elements of caregiving or mm -hmm. caretaking. Most because it's not me, I'm trying to take care of myself, I'm trying to take care of my husband, but he's trying to take care of me at the same mm -hmm. time. And it's the business of what, what do you do? 
and that the cardiac episode at the end is the the phys the reaction to all of those complexities that you have no solutions to. So yeah, you really are having a sort of metaphorical cardiac arrest. The poetics of this piece, um, they're really uh, wonderful. You make so many choices that heighten the urgency. And so I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions about some of the choices that oh. you made in the craft of the poem. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you notice when you look at the poem is that it's a prose poem. It's in a block. It's not delineated. Right. And when I read it at first, what I was struck by was this kind of feeling of uh, claustrophobia. You know, there aren't lines where there's a lot of white space. And so I was wondering if the poem, if you, how you made that decision of making it a prose poem instead of delineating it. There's this quote by Wallace Stevens, and he says, the poet is the priest of the invisible. And so much of caretaking is invisible labor. So I was wondering if you could speak to the act of crafting the poem and also the how the labor of being a caretaker intersect, intersects with the labor of being a poet. I think I wrote it the way I did because that's the way it happened. And I wanted, mm -hmm. I, I wanted the speed of the thing not to be broken up. And I wanted it to be not, not cause and effect, but continual cause. This happened because this and because this. And I wanted to stack those up to give the sense of urgency ending with me standing in front of the of the of the desk and saying it's what's going on then i went through with a lot of a lot of editorial help in in terms of breaking up breaking up the becauses so that it it kept that that sense of of urgency and watching trying to watch the the way the lines ended which was kind of hard to do but i wanted the word the ending the words ending the lines to have weight too mm -hmm. um, which even though it's a prose block, even which though it's a prose poem, right? Even though it's a prose poem, the thing that was that I love about writing poetry almost more than anything else is is revising and editing. Once this one was on the page, you know, it felt it if it, it felt right and it felt like it needed craft, and I was able to another lovely thing. You're able to distance yourself from the thing that's happened. And, and craft it so that it, it stands by itself. And in some ways, in a lot of ways that heals. You know, Jericho Brown says something that I love about um, when you write a poem, you kind of, you put the trauma on the page, but then it gives you, it, it puts distance between you and the trauma, exactly, right? Exactly so right. it's a way of creating perspective. So I was wondering, you know, when, you, when you wrote this poem, did the idea of hope enter the poem? Like, did you have a hope for the speaker that at the end of the poem that she would get the help and the support that she clearly needs? Right. Or was that, did that not enter into your thinking? No, you know what entered into my thinking when I wrote it was denial. <laughs> mm. it, it isn't happening. I'm not going to let it happen. And so it isn't. And I, I was more aware because I, by the time I got there, I felt better. Um, and I was more aware of the irony in the statement than I was aware of what was actually happening to me, that it was a cardiac, it was sort of a metaphorical cardiac episode because of all the things that it might have been. Yes. I would just like to thank you for submitting it and for taking the care to shepherd the work. And we're so grateful for your time. I can't thank you enough either. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Tara. We're now going to turn to another caregiver, Sheila Johnson, who is a baker, a social media freelancer, and most importantly, she says, caregiver to her BBE, best brother ever. And I asked Sheila, what surprised her most about becoming a caregiver? Um, the one thing that really surprised me and continues that to surprise me is the um, the advocacy that you have to constantly do. So, like, what what is that? What form does that take? 
Um, it takes all kinds of form. Um, my brother, he was shot um, 29 years ago from a gunshot wound. Um, so he's a quadriplegic. You know, sometimes I feel like um, they feel like his life is expendable um, because of his condition. Um, and like during COVID, you know, like when people were talking about ventilators and, you know, they were on short supply. Um, so we just had to make sure that, you know, we, that he has, cause he's on a ventilator sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just always advocacy. It's from doctors, for people explaining to you so you can make sure that you understand, um, you know, what they're talking about. And also I like to know like what the options are. And he does too, cause he's lucid. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of his, um, his spokesperson or whatever. Um, so we like to understand. So, you know, I always have notebooks. I'm Googling things. I'm trying to understand them. Um, and just, you know, with medicines, the side effects that they have, you know, if he really wants to do that, because, you know, it is his life. So he should be able to decide and he needs to understand everything that's going on with him. All right. So 29 years, that's a big portion of your life. Yes, yes, it is. It really is. Um, because my parents, my mother died like 20, 24 years ago, and my father has been deceased for um, approximately eight years. Um, and so he had lived with him. Um, I always went there and took care of him. But once that happened, then he came into my home um, and he's been here for about eight years. Wow. And I'm curious if you ever turned to the arts or music or literature for comfort during this caregiving journey. Um, all the time. Um, I'm a writer also. I like to write. I like to write poetry. Um, I was a part of a, um, a writer's group. We haven't really met since COVID, um, but I still stay in constant contact with some of the um, women that were in the group. Um, I also like music. It's kind of therapeutic for me. So when I can get out in the mornings, I like to walk. Um, and I have three songs that I like to listen to to kind of get me going. I listen to Mary J. Blige's um, Good Morning Gorgeous. Um, and then I listen to two <laughs> gospel songs. Um, one is I Never Would Have Made It. And the other one is um, You Saw the Best in Me. So those things kind of set my tone for the day. And like I hadn't walked in like a week and I can just tell when I don't do those things. Um, and I journal, I journal every day. And then I do a brain dump at night to try to get things out of my head. Wow. And so I'm curious about your writing. What mm -hmm. attracted you to poetry? Why did you choose poetry as your writing medium? Um, Ed, I don't know. It's just something about it. Um, and I, I've started to like it more as I've gotten older, too. And I think that poetry has changed over the years. Like when I was in high school, I remember being a senior. We had to learn like 15 poems, um, you know, verbatim without looking at them, you know, like leaves of grass and all these other things, you know. But as time has went on, it's become more of a free flowing thing where you don't have to always rhyme to me. Um, and I think that's what makes it um, a good outlet also, that you can just, you know, you're not constrained um, the way that poetry seemed like it was before. What would you tell others about caregiving? Someone who might, for example, be just beginning the process that mm -hmm. they would need to know? Um, I think that you should give yourself grace, that you have to learn that. I mean, because I think caregiving has come a long way. Um, like I said, he... Um, got shot like 29 years ago, um, but it's come a long way. More attention has been applied or um, centered on caregiving. Um, but for me, you know, I just had to learn as I go and we all will have to learn as I go, but you need to give yourself grace and that you have to realize that, you know, you're not just going to hit it out the park all the time. And that as long as you put your best foot forward um, and that you know that you're doing the best that you can, then that's all that you can um, expect from yourself. Mm -hmm. And in return, I think your loved one will appreciate that. Thank you, Sheila. We'll now turn to fiction. Stephanie Isan is a queer Taiwanese American writer, poet, and software engineer. Her story, The Last Thing She Touched, is about a young woman who is estranged from her family and learns about her own terminal diagnosis at about the same time that her beloved dog, Wawa, is also dying. She and her wife must navigate the complexities of caregiving and end-of-life issues on many fronts. 
Stephanie will be interviewed by assistant fiction editor, Doris W. Chen. My mother scrubbed her hands, her back rigid and flat. Sweat dripped down her temples. A whiskey strand of baby hair unwound itself from her bun and clung to her wet cheek. I am glad your Baba is dead, she said quietly, so he wouldn't have to see what I saw last night. She took a long look at the clock, then at the hallway behind her. Grace was asleep. She had been so excited when I had come home from college, demanding piggyback rides she was too old to ask for, and sweets I had no money to pay for. I'd promised to play video games with her the next day. If you could get out before Mei Mei wakes up, I don't want to explain this to her. But where, where am I supposed to go? Lillian, my mother said, turning towards me for the first time. Her lips curled into a mockery of a smile. If you don't want to leave that girl, then she can keep you. I did not call my mother as my body welted or burned or when every bone in my body seemingly expanded filled more space than needed, grew needles. Just like I'm sure she wants a version of me that never existed, a daughter in her imagination, delicately constructed from pillars of salt. I want a mother I have grieved the loss of year after year, as surely as the seasons change. It was Sarah who held my hand. She sponged my sweat, wiped my tears, dabbed my dry lips with water-soaked cotton tips. She took me to every treatment, waited after every surgery, and kept track of every pill and doctor, and slept every night by my side. Whether she wanted to or had to, it didn't matter. She was there. I want to love her more than I can. I want to kiss her, make love to her, but I can't, and she won't. Sarah looks at me with the blue in her lovely, doe brown eyes. When she kisses me goodnight and turns the other way in bed, I let her. When she cries softly, alone in the bathroom, early in the morning when she thinks I can't hear, I let her. When she writes about me, about our lives together, I let her. I let her, because what else can I do for her now? In the veterinary examination room, I give Wawa a fat, double pastrami, extra bacon sandwich I bought at the deli next door. Her eyes brighten as if she's just won the canine Mega Millions. <laughs> she cranes her neck gingerly towards the sandwich, grimacing slightly from her renewed and sudden eagerness. I give her a gentle pat on the rump and stroke underneath her chin, her favorite spot. She hangs her mouth open in contented glee, breathing hard, pastrami breath filling the air. I'm sorry your other mom couldn't come, I tell her. She licks my cheek a few times, cleaning my tears for dessert. When I was still working, she used to love going to the office with me. We trotted happily past the snobby mansions of Knob Hill, and she settled at my feet as I wrote code and ran meetings. Strangers often asked, adopted or shocked, rescue or purebred? And I always wanted to say, mine. <laughs> I carried her in my goddamn womb for nine months. She came from me, my blood, my sweat, my tears, my baby, mine. Wawa and I wait and wait for the vet and wait and wait some more, but I don't mind. She puts her head in my lap and I cradle her. I run my hands through her fur again and again and I bury my face in her smell, a soothing, crispy corn chip smell she's had since she was a puppy, so small she barely fit in my cup palms. Earlier that day, I stopped myself from calling the vet. I dialed, I hung up, I petted her some more. I waited. I wiped another puddle of urine as she whimpered on the couch. I gave her a handful of teriyaki chicken from the fridge, sauce and all. I put her in our grocery wagon and walked her around the block. I let her growl out a floating plastic bag, commending her for her bravery, for protecting us. I thought about letting her go naturally, keeping her with me as long as I could, perhaps even until it was my own time months from now. I could hold her as I drifted away. I didn't want to be alone, but I knew she didn't want to be either.
you have to wait for me, okay? You can't go and chase after a squirrel and not wait for me. I'd read somewhere Catholics believe animals don't have souls and can't go to heaven. Just as well, lesbians aren't offered that privilege either. Just be patient. I'll be there soon enough, wherever it is. The vet finally comes in, her face grim and cherry. I smile for Wawa. I tell her I love her. We love her. She wags her tail like a feather duster, brushing against a piece of fine china. Then she closes her eyes as if falling asleep on the grass after a long, long walk on a lazy summer day, dandelion puffs twisting past the soft tufts of fur on her ears. Um, what's striking is not just the love, but the complexity of Lillian and Sarah's relationship as it moves through grief. How do you see their relationship redefining conventional ideas of family and caregiving? I think Sarah, for me, taking care of Lillian isn't necessarily like a caregiving relationship. I think of as completely out of the norm. I think taking care of your wife or your partner who is ill is difficult, but is not uncommon. I think what's interesting to me when I was writing this is thinking about this relationship where Sarah is nurturing, but she's also using the situation to achieve success in her writing. And while Lillian isn't like stoked about this, <laughs> she's allowing Sarah to do this. In a way, I think of, I think Lillian's allowance for this as a form of love. It's one of the few things I think she believes that she might have some agency over and she gives this up to Sarah because she wants her to succeed. And one of the themes I kind of hope to get across in this story was this concept of chosen family, even if it's not entirely explicit. And Lillian's mother and the scenes that she's in, she's not entirely very nurturing, but I think in times of illness or weakness, it's a very human thing to want to be mothered or taken care of, and maybe not necessarily by their own mother, but by a mother. And I think it's common to want family by your side, even if you're estranged and to see them for one last time and to make amends. But it was really important to me that in the end, even though Lillian misses her mother desperately, she doesn't even attempt to reach out. And it's a choice she makes, whether it's made because she doesn't want to or think it's futile, it's still a choice that she makes. And Sarah and Wawa are who Lillian chooses to be in her life in the end. And I think that's at least something unconventional, at least to me. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, that was, I think, such a poignant ending um, where she, um, you know, she is thinking about it and there's such a sense, but, but she chooses not to, you know, because she can't. Um, and the people that matter to her are, are her chosen family. It's Sarah and it's, um, and it's, it's Wawa, it's her pet. Um, Wawa has such a big role in this story. The, the story opens with Lillian walking into her house and discovering Wawa's near death and then having to make this very difficult decision. Why did you choose to give the pet such a big role in the story? I think, so for a while when I was writing this story, I was thinking about the concept of what, what a good death is, right? Like what defines a good death? And I think it can be a pretty, like it can be somewhat controversial <laughs> or, but I think I'm of the opinion that if we, we can, we should give the animals we love a good death because we have the ability to. But then like, what exactly, like I was thinking, defines a good death, right? Not being alone when you're dying, not being in pain, having dignity, agency, and feeling safe and loved. And when exactly do you decide on this particular moment for a pet that you love? You know, when the pain is too much for them or when the pain is too much for you as the person who's taking care of them to witness. And I think there's like a lot of power that's unwanted in that decision, a lot of complication. And it's not necessarily that something that humans can do for each other or for our loved ones, even if we wanted to. So I made Wawa like a big part of the story because I think she symbolizes for me a few things, obviously drawing a parallel to Lillian's own situation and illness, but she's also a surrogate for the child that Lillian could not have. Her name Wawa actually means doll in Mandarin, which is a nickname I've heard some mothers give their children. It's Wawa. <laughs> um, and Wawa's death helps Lillian and Sarah accept Lillian's own end. Um, there will be no experimental trial for Lillian, no, pro like no prolonging what could be painful or complicated for her. And it's Lillian's choice that she makes and she's exercising what little agency I think she has to define her own version of a good death. 
I also made Walla a big part because I think, you know, the dog and canine or canine and human relationship is like very, very primal, right? We grew up with dogs. It's more like if you see a dog in a movie, you don't want them to die. You're like sad. And in writing about Sarah, whose writing career is very contingent on this growing grief, part of the story was me trying to do this like meta crafting of this very tragic story because I'm trying to write the very thing I'm also trying to discuss and explore and poke at this, this commodification of grief. The part where you were reading um, where Lillian is telling Walla to wait for her. I mean, I think that just resonates with so many of us with our relationships with our own pets and just, you know, um, because it is a very, um, very profound love that we have. Um, and then the aspect of writing is also really interesting. One of our editors uh, described this story as it's a story of love and loss. And it's also about writing. And as you mentioned, Sarah's writing a book on Lillian's illness, and she's also um, benefiting from it and, and trying to sort of capitalize on it to advance her own writing career. And this is something Lillian has mixed feelings about, but at the, you know, at the same time, it's also a way for her to exercise care because she knows if, Sarah, if Sarah's book is successful, that um, Sarah will be taken care of when she's gone. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about this, um, what you were trying to explore through bringing in this aspect of, of writing um, and, and its connection to caregiving? I think, I think for me personally, writing has always been very complicated. Um, it's a very like vulnerable thing, like anyone else who writes will probably say. And, you know, I think some people say that they're like compelled to write and I wish I was like that, you know, or just words just spit out at me. But for me, it's fundamentally just a lot of hard work. You know, I have to tell myself every day to sit in front of a computer and put in the hours. But I do this because I know when I carve out time for it, every day it makes me happier the way exercise and clean eating and therapy does <laughs> and I would say it's like caregiving for myself you know and writing has always been there for me in times of joy and in grief um, not everything that nurtures I think is easy or comes easy but focusing on craft I think gives me a purpose and I think that's one of the best things to feel and the short lives that we all have is to feel as if we have purpose. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Doris. The final caregiver who will grace us with her insights is Melissa Martin. Okay. So my name is Melissa Martin and I live in Baltimore, Maryland, um, in downtown Baltimore. So very close to the Inner Harbor, if you're familiar with Baltimore. And I currently run a nonprofit called Stanley Snacks for School Kids, and we supply snacks to public schools for kids who suffer from food insecurity and hunger. But most importantly, I'm the wife of uh, Thomas Carney, who was a professor at University of Baltimore, and now his, um, his main caregiver. Uh, so tell me the condition that your husband has. He actually has a degenerative progressive neurological disease. Um, there are thoughts that me, he may have multiple symptoms atrophy. There are thoughts that he may have vascular dementia or even Lewy body dementia. But as it's been explained to me, until the physician can hold his brain, they won't exactly know what he has. Um, so he falls a lot. He has a problem with balance and coordination. Um, most recently, problems swallowing. Um, so anything that's kind of automatic, um, he's been having issues with. So it sounds very wide ranging that your caregiving skills and challenges cover many, many different you know, areas of life. And I'm wondering, is there anything that surprised you about becoming a caregiver that you didn't expect? Um everything, just all the challenges that come with it. Um, I told somebody the other day, just getting all the doctors on the same page to discuss care and trying to determine which, who is what, um, trying to get friends to visit and friends to acknowledge that I need support. So it's a lot, um, but I wouldn't change it any other way. It has brought me much closer to my husband. Um, it has taught me a level of love and compassion that I never knew I had. Did any doctor or nurse along the way talk to you about what you would need for yourself as a caregiver? Five years ago, if you had said to me, um, 
going to the grocery store would be a struggle. I would have laughed. Um, but that's sometimes what we need as caregivers, somebody to go to the grocery store. Right. Um, do you ever turn to the arts or music or literature when, when it comes to yourself for healing or for your husband for caregiving? Yes. So um, behind me is a um, poster of one of our favorite artists that normally wouldn't just be hanging up on the wall. It would be framed. Um, but one of the things that I have found um, comforting to me is to know that we share the love of certain artists. Um, and so I've recently been buying some of this artist Klimt's books, um, going online, reading more, um, and sharing it with my husband. So in my husband's room right now, he has several books about Klimt. Um, my husband loves the Beatles, so he has Beatles books. Um, and then I play music often in his room. Um, and I find that's comfort for both of us. Um, and I tend at night to turn music on in the house, um, sometimes to dance, sometimes to feel lively, um, but sometimes to remember those good memories. Um, our first song that we danced to was um, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You by Frankie Valley. I will play that song to remember that moment. But I also read every day um, a book called daily words for caregivers, which I wouldn't say I'm a religious person, but I'm spiritual. And sometimes the words, you know, words have a lot of power. Um, and so sometimes just reading that days, um, it makes you feel less isolated. Um, understanding that somebody you don't even know is going through the same type of thing. It's interesting the way you talk about the music. It's almost as though the music or the artistry of the music it sort of holds the memories because it's, it's hard to keep track of everything. And, and the arts may sort of help us with the emotional filing system, memories, love. Exactly. Life. And it's funny because I did not realize until recently, um, recently my, my husband had a medical procedure and um, they didn't really put him to sleep, but they gave him some kind of medication to relax him. And he was really struggling to come out of that medication. And I happened to be in his um, room visiting and had the music on and a Beatles song came on. Um, hey Jude, which is kind of loud and kind of fun. And all of a sudden he was singing to it, but he was sound asleep, but he was singing to the song. And as soon as the song was over, another song came on the radio. And he, he said to me, I want to listen to Beatles. And I thought, wow. And so music has become, for me and him, a way to connect without having to connect. And you mentioned that you've been reading poetry. Why are you turning to poetry? Reading some of the poetry brings me to a place that I can feel. Um, I think a lot of times for me in caregiving, um, it becomes all about my husband and um not wanting necessarily to face the facts of what's really going on, but recently reading some poems that people have written about grief and about um, stress. It's just, it pulls you into a place where you have that sense of feeling, that sense of belonging and being able to be in tune. Thank you, Melissa, for rounding out this conversation. As Melissa reminded us, Words have power. They can bring us comfort, challenge us, inspire us, rattle us, lots of things. If you haven't gotten your dose of power yet, why not pick up issue 45 of BLR, our special issue on the theme of taking care. It's jam-packed with poetry, fiction, nonfiction, book review, and of course, gorgeous cover art by Tatana Kellner. Better yet, why not become a BLR subscriber? It costs less than going out for a single meal and gets you a whole year of literary power. Thank you to all of our authors, editors, and caregivers for sharing your time and your thoughts. Thank you to AARP for supporting this issue of BLR as well as tonight's event, and also for connecting us with the caregivers that you met. And a very special shout out to you, our audience, for joining us to help create this very special gathering. We hope to see you at the next BLR event.